you will have time to finish on Thursday. For Lab 22, there is a, um, a page where you go over like a paragraph, a whole page of points where you have to write kind of like a lab write-up of the lab. So what I do with those is you have to do a peer review. So you write yours up, someone else at your table writes theirs up, and then you switch and you grade theirs. You like make corrections and suggestions, and then you incorporate their corrections and suggestions, kind of retool yours, and then um, you will hand it in. So depending on where you get to today, probably wait for peer reviews until Thursday. But that is part of this process of this particular Lab 22. <clears throat> lab 22 is very particular about the wording about evolution of bacteria, natural selection, mutation. So definitely this is a great lab to not only that page where you have to write up the kind of lab write up, but also all of your questions to go over with your teammates, your lab mates as well. Lab 24, just watering and spraying. Make sure again, you're only spraying the variable group, variable group and you are watering both. Uh, homework, continue to work on your objectives. Thursday. <clears throat> Thursday, we're wrapping up the unit. Oh, wow. So next Tuesday, you have an exam. I'll talk about that in a second. So we'll finish up Tuesday. We'll finish up Lab 22 on Tuesday. We'll start recording our data for Lab 24. Um, if you are planning to graduate at the end of this semester, you have to fill out some paperwork. It is due by Thursday. So please make sure you do that. <clears throat> I was always one of those people that went like, what? We had to do what? <laughs> so here's your reminder. If you're planning on graduating, make sure you get that spring graduation petition in. Um, otherwise, you won't be able to graduate. Tell your friends. Evolution exam. So the way I do exams is you come in here, everything is away, you have your pencil. Um, I will have calculators for you. You will have a Hardy Weinberg on there for sure, for sure. So I've got a lot of resources, practice problems, examples of Hardy Weinberg, me going through some problems on YouTube. Definitely you want to, what I would say, go onto YouTube the page where I have all the questions, I would say work through that so that you, yeah, I have the links on Canvas. I sent them out yesterday as well. Um, but work through the, like I would stop, I would play the video, answer all the questions before I solve, show you how to solve them. So work through them and then make sure like you match up how I'm solving them with the way you solve them. Don't just watch and be like, yeah, I got it. You really need to understand. So please make sure that you're utilizing all of those resources I have on Canvas for you, that you know how to do a simple Hardy Weinberg. Not like the last two pages of the lab, but like how we did those initial, we collected the data and we just worked through them simply. You have to know what's P, what's Q, what's PQ squared, 2PQ, Q squared, uh, what do they represent? Where do you find them on the Punnett square? How do you solve for the whole thing? So make sure you know all that. Practice, practice, practice. Um, exams are 53 questions, but they're out of 50 points. You get three extra credit questions on the exam. They are not the last three. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> they're not the last three. They're any three. So I, I really want you to understand this, that the extra credits, I make it, I just total up your exam. And so let's say that you get 48. I take that out of 50. I don't care if you got the last three right or, um, or last three wrong, or you got, you know, like seven, 11 and 12 wrong. Any three you get wrong are replaced by that extra credit. So it doesn't have to be the last three. So that is a better way of doing this extra credit for you rather than being like, all the stakes are on these three questions. No, you can get any three wrong and still get a perfect score. So that's good for you. Like, it's a very nice thing for you. Um, hopefully, y'all, does everybody understand that? 
Okay, because a lot of students every semester they get to the fourth exam and they're like, wait, aren't the last three extra credit? I'm like, no, 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 any three. So that works in your favor. Um, the exams are multiple choice. So you just have to pick out the right answer. The answers are, are there for you. They it will incorporate images, data, pictures, Definitely when you're going through your notes in the notebook, you wanna make sure you are studying everything so that if I have a picture in there, it is purposeful. You wanna make sure like, why did she have this picture in here? Oh, I probably need to know something about it. Why is there this that's labeled? I probably should study, study that labeled image. So make sure you're understanding not only just the word parts, but the image, data, etc. anything visual because those can show up and have questions about them as well. And again, there will be a Hardy Weinberg. It will be somewhere between six and eight questions. So if you don't know Hardy Weinberg, you're gonna go down a grade automatically. So make sure, make sure you get that. Um, Hardy Weinberg, for a lot of you who are biology majors, will come back. You will have this appear in your futures. Um, for some reason, exams, they like to have Hardy Weinberg questions on those board exams. Was it on the dental exam? It was, yeah. it was on the dental exam. There you go. Same. Okay. So um, they come back. Yeah. They are like, this is a great thing to ask questions about. Okay. So 53 questions out of 50. You can get three wrong, still get a perfect score. So that lowers the pressure a little bit on you all. Um, after you take the exam, uh, what you're going to do at the exam is you're going to write all of your answers on the exam copy. So you can write on your exam copy, definitely use those test taking strategies, cross off things that you automatically know are not right. So it, like visually, it gives you that confidence, like, oh cool, I already crossed off two, or I crossed off three, I just gotta pick between these two. You can write notes on there, you can do calculations on there. So you can write on the exam. <laughs> um, after you take the exam, you're gonna write all your answers on the exam copy and on your Scantron. When you're done with the exam, you will bring me your Scantron and I will give you a copy of the key and a purple pen. You will sit down back at your desk and right away you get to grade your exam. So you can see, you can go through and see what you got right and wrong. So that's nice. And you know exactly what you got, um, you know why you got what you got and you can ask me any questions. When you're done grading it, you'll bring me the exam copy and your copy of the exam and the pen and then you'll go to lab and you will measure day five. So we'll start day zero on Thursday and day five, you'll just do a measure, take data, water and spray. Anybody have any logistic questions for unit one? That's it, we're, we're wrapping up in one week, wrapping it up. So we're going to talk about section um, chapter 18, section point two, and talk a little bit about species isolation. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Thank you, thank you. Got it. Oh, 99. No, uh, uh, uh. Good. Right after Hardy Weinberg ends. Yeah. All right. So, um, yeah. 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 Let's talk about the idea of species. So, all of us in this room are of the same species. What that means is we all have the same basic genetics. We can mate with each other, I should say, potentially mate with each other which makes us what we call reproductively isolated from other species. And reproductive isolation is in regard to, we can mate with other homo sapiens successfully. We can have offspring who can have offspring. A big piece of evolution is that next generation thing so that in natural selection, those individuals who are selected for have the advantageous traits, have an easy time surviving. And the big key thing about evolution and talking about natural selection 
is that they can have offspring with these advantageous traits and keep the species or the population going. That's really, really important evolution. You can't change over time if you don't have any more species to go on in the future. Reproductive isolation means that we can have offspring who are fertile so that our offspring can have offspring and keep us going. Hypothetically, you could have sex with a chimpanzee. Hopefully you don't want to, but hypothetically, you could physically have sex with them. Because we are different species than a chimpanzee, our offspring, let's say you and a chimpanzee, you mate together and um, either you get pregnant or the chimpanzee gets pregnant. It means that that is not, or maybe you don't even get pregnant, but you can't have offspring together because you're just different enough genetically. You are isolated from all of our species for having fertile offspring. So that's what we mean by reproductively isolated, is that you can't have offspring. So fertile offspring is key, key, key when we're talking about a species. There's a lot of different definitions of species. And if you, you know, go on and study other kinds of biology, you will find that there's a lot of categories of what this one will say, species is this and that and that. But just know in general, this, when we're talking about evolution, is being reproductively successful and not isolated, meaning that you have offspring that are fertile who can keep us going as a species. So reproductive isolation happens within a population's species. We can only mate with each other successfully. And there are isolating mechanisms, reproductive isolating mechanisms that separate us from other species. And there are reasons why. We're going to go through all these different reasons. And they go from super duper obvious reasons to, oh, wow, this really gets into our genetics and the cellular level. So we're going to get into those kind of obvious to more biochemical reasons. So the first group that we're going to talk about are, so sorry, before we get there, we're isolated so that you can't mate with someone else to make a new generation. <clears throat> Remember this term fitness I introduced last lecture. <clears throat> That when we're talking about fitness, it's not like how strong you are. Fitness is in regard to your ability to make offspring and to make a lot of them. So that the more fit an organism is, is the more offspring they contribute to the population. So reproductive success, more fitness, more offspring are had by that individual or that mating pair. Remember that. Make a little note. We're going to talk about the pre-mating isolation before, when we're talking about pre-mating or pre-zygotic, let me talk about each of these terms. Pre-mating means before the act of sex happens. Pre-zygotic means when we're talking about zygotes, that's that first cell, when sperm and egg come together, they make the zygote. It's before that happens. So both of these indicate whether you're talking about, you know, it depends on which textbook you look at, whether you're talking about pre-mating or pre-zygotic. They're both indicating that no sexual reproduction and no zygote is formed. And we'll take a look at each of these different levels here. So first, let's talk about geographical isolation. So if there is a sea turtle and it lives in the Caribbean on this side of the world, and there's a sea turtle who lives in the Philippines on the other side of the world, can they physically mate together right now? No, they're in totally different locations, right? So they cannot physically get together and mate. That's what we call geographical isolation. They don't live with each other, so they can't mate. So that one seems, hopefully, a pretty obvious one. This one less obvious. Ecological isolation 
is when you do live in the same area, but you don't do the same thing. So you never cross paths. You never meet each other. I am sure you all have met someone, remember, maybe it's in high school or college or at your job or somewhere out in the world, and you meet somebody and they say, you're like, oh, I live um, in this area. And they say, oh, so do I. And they say, where do you, where do you live? And then you say, I live on these, this block and blah, blah, blah. And they say, I live on that block. And you go, wait, what? And you find out this person who you have never seen before in your life lives a block away from you. Ever happen? Or somebody lives really close to you and you're like, or you go to the same gym, but you've never seen each other. And you both do certain things, but you've never crossed paths. That's because you just do different things within the same environment. So there are 750 species of fig wasps. They pollinate fig plants, trees. But if a fig wasp, this one, only goes to this specific species of tree, and this one only goes to this specific species of tree, and the two trees are even next to each other, they might not ever cross paths because this one always goes here and this one always goes there. But they never meet up even though they're right next door to each other. That's ecological isolation. Again, this one's a little bit harder to wrap your brain around. You are in the same area, but you just never do the same thing, so you never meet up. Temporal isolation. Temporal means time. Many species mate at certain times of the year. So there are birds who some of them mate in the spring and some of them mate in the fall. And if you're a spring mater, you're never going to meet up with a fall mater. You're just like not looking in the spring for anybody who's mating in the fall and vice versa. So you're never going to mate at the same time, which means you're never going to meet up for mating. You, meet at, you mate at different times, so you don't meet. Behavioral isolation. This one is amazing. If you're ever bored and you want to just like crack up, go on, you know, YouTube or wherever else you go and put in mating behaviors. Animals especially do crazy things to attract mates. This is probably true of why you are attracted to certain people and some people you are just not attracted to. So for birds, they will do these dances. The males typically are trying to attract the females and the males will get down and they'll like do this with their feathers and they'll make noises. And if the female's like, weird, she's gonna walk away. Within a species, you have to, the female has to appreciate the male's mating behaviors. And if she doesn't, she's gonna be like, no, I do not wanna mate with that one doesn't have the right behaviors for me. All right, so we'll take a look at a couple. Oh, it's Russian. Gosh, why? Mm -hmm. 
做我们的事，有时候没有感觉，他就会自己变成一种负担，变成一种放弃自己的。So that that's like a sexy stance for these camels, to get in that position and do a song to try and attract the female and slap. You can see how raw the skin is. Like there's a callus here from slapping their tails against their butts. That is their way to try and attract females too. Very strange. Okay, and then. Let's go to. There's tons of those, though. You can watch videos for hours about the different behavioral isolations. Mechanical isolation means that the parts, the sexual parts, the penis and the vagina, are not compatible. They don't fit together. So I always like to say that you're not going to see an elephant and a small tt monkey mating for hopefully obvious reasons. Their parts just don't fit. <clears throat> so this is like the last step that they're they might try to get together and they're like well pff, i can't fit my penis in your vagina or vice versa so we're not going to make those can all make the act of sex not occur so let's take it to the next level let's say that all of those things are met They mate at the same time. They get the same behaviors. They live in the same area. They cross paths.、Um, their parts fit, so they can and they do have sex. But there's other things that can stop them. So this is what we call the post mating or post sex or post zygotic, meaning that a zygote can be formed, that sperm and egg can get together. So let's take a look at these three different levels here. Biggest thing, though, is that even though maybe a zygote is formed or the sperm and egg kind of circle each other, there's a problem with either the zygote forming or the zygote surviving. So we'll take a look at each of those three different mechanisms as to why and what's happening here. The first one is called gamete incompatibility. In this, the sperm and the egg have different surface markers, so they don't fuse together. So we're going to take a look at the species surface markers on our cells. If we take a look at the surface of our cells, what we find is that there's a whole bunch of tags of information on there. There are little, sometimes they're called glycoprotein attachment sites or attachment sites. Is that we have all of these little things that stick out from the surface of our cells, and they have information like what species you are, what sex you are, what blood type you have, whether you Um, are tall or short or somewhere in between. So there's just a lot of information that sticks out on our cells. When one of the easiest things for one cell to another cell to identify whether you're a what we would call self cell, or you're another cell, or you're the same species of cell, is that you take a look at this specific cell called a surface marker on the sperm. Let's say that the surface marker for species is shaped like that. So those species surface markers for the sperm, what will happen is members of the same species will be able to fit a circle surface marker into this shape, so that they come together like two pieces of a puzzle. And when they do that, 
what the sperm knows is, oh, okay, whoever I'm trying to mate with the, um, and we'll get to this later in the semester, but we don't call an egg an egg until it's fertilized. It's actually called an oocyte, just to be biologically correct. So if a sperm is coming to an oocyte, this shape is going to fit into there, or this shape is going to fit into a shape like that. Those are the species surface markers. So in this case, if we're taking a look at between the sperm and the oocyte, if the oocyte, it has a square shape surface marker, they're not going to match up. And that's like the easiest way for two cells to determine, are you one of me or are you something else? It's exactly the way our immune system works. So that if you have a bacterial infection or you have a virus particle inside of you, these markers on the surface, what our white blood cells are doing is that they have these surface markers and they're just going up and being like, do you fit? Yep. Do you fit? Yep. Do you fit? Yep. Wait, no. Oh, you don't fit. And then it tags it for destruction. In this case, what happens is the sperm will not be able to fuse with the egg, and therefore the sperm cannot contribute its DNA to the oocyte or the egg's DNA to make that zygote. So that's a very simple first level of what we would call gamete incompatibility. Sometimes it's called gametic incompatibility. and a nice easy way to do that quick check. So sperm cannot bind with the surface marker of the oocyte or egg that sticks out of the plasma membrane of the oocyte. Next level is called hybrid inviability. So hybrid, what we're thinking is that we're taking members of two species and trying to make some kind of like hybrid organism. In this case, fertilization can occur, but then genetically, or we'll talk about other ways, something else is going to go wrong where that hybrid, that combination organism, isn't able to continue to replicate cells and survive. So if we're taking a look at two different species, and let's say here, for example, you have a sperm that's from an organism that has a species chromosome number of 40. Humans, we have a species chromosome number of 46. And then our sperm and our egg have half that amount of genetic information. So if they have a species number of 40, the sperm and egg will have 20 each, which means that when sperm 20 and egg 20 come together, they make again back to 40 for the species number. Let's say that you have an oocyte 
that has a species chromosome number of 42, so that the oocyte is going to have 21 chromosomes that it's going to carry. Now, let's say that their surface markers are close enough, that the surface markers are close enough, so they're like, okay, we can get together. And then the sperm contributes its chromosomes with the eggs. Hmm. So now we've got a new species here. We've got something that has a chromosome number of 41. It's not this, and it's not that. Here's the thing about genetics in terms of our DNA. With DNA, and we're talking about having enough, like here you've got, well, you've got either more for this species of DNA, or if we're looking at this species, less for this. With species, you want to have precisely the right amount of DNA. Remember, we talked about last week that DNA codes for it's transcripted into RNA, and then RNA is translated into protein. And it's all the, when we say the protein, it's all the important stuff in the cell or within an organism. Um, would that fall under like a mutation? Um, a mutation is a change in the DNA. So this is what we would call um, the. It's a different biological term that'll come to me, I'm sure, after class. Uh, but it is a different form of the wrong genetic stuff, like the wrong number. So, good question. Um, so when we're looking at that process, if you have not enough DNA, that's obvious, right? If you don't have enough DNA, you're not able to have the instructions to build important things within the cell or within the organism. But what about if you have too much DNA? Oftentimes we think like, well, if I get more of something, that's good, right? If somebody, you know, you went to the store and someone is supposed to give you $20 back and they give you 100 back, you're like, woo, I got more money. That's not the way DNA works. DNA is really particular about having precisely the right amount. If you have too much, you get too much protein and other good stuff, the important stuff in the body, and that can cause disorder within a cell, a tissue, an organ, within an organism. And having too much of that good stuff interferes with the ability of the stuff to work properly. Having too much of the good stuff can cause you to have diseases and disorders. So kind of interesting in terms of, it doesn't always work like too much is great. No, it doesn't work like that. Too much is bad. So in this case, if we're looking at this organism, again, they're going to have too much. And this organ organism wouldn't have enough. So what happens is because these species numbers that are halved, halved in the sperm and the egg don't add up to a proper species number for either of these, that these chromosomes may start to replicate and start going through the process of making two cells to four cell cells, what we call cleavage. But eventually, those cells are like, this is too much. There's too much stuff in here for one of us and not enough for the other one. And it's just going to stop the process of replication. So that's one thing that can happen. So I just think that's kind of interesting. We're talking about the precise number of chromosomes having not enough obvious can't make stuff that you need, but having too much, that's still not good. When this happens, when we're not talking about different species mating, but when we're just talking about our own cells, and when our own cells produce, like copy an extra chromosome, it's called non-disjunction, where something happens where the chromosomes don't move appropriately during the process of meiosis. I see a bunch of you nodding along, like, oh yeah, I remember that non-disjunction thing. And in some cells, you end up with not enough chromosomes, and in some, you end up with too many chromosomes. Um, that's what happens naturally when we have the same number of chromosomes like us, and there's something that goes wrong. We have disorders, like, for example, when you have three number 21 chromosomes, it's called trisomy 21, or results in Down syndrome. And Down syndrome, you have one whole extra chromosome in every cell in the body. And what that extra chromosome results in is it results in having heart issues, having joint issues, um, mental retardation, 
and amongst other issues that the person suffers from is they suffer from a holistic array of diseases by having an extra chromosome. So that DNA is very, it's precise. It needs to be precise. What this often results in is what we would call a spontaneous abortion. Is the body just stops producing the zygote. Stops going through that process of cleavage to go from those two to four to six to eight cells. So in frogs, when you have leopard frogs and they're introduced to a species that's close to them, the wood frogs, they're very similar in nature. They get fertile eggs, but they never ever get offspring. So they're close, but um, even if sometimes they produce the embryo, I mean, they produce the offspring, the offspring only live for a couple days and then they just die. All right, next level, hybrid, sorry. because the, the, the sex happens. So if the sex happens, it's post-zygotic. Yeah, so that's kind of like a, there's something that happens with the, the formation of the zygote. So it might not necessarily be that there is a zygote, but in that process of trying to make the zygote, something happens. So sex, really the pre and post are separated or differentiated by sex. These ones, sex doesn't happen. These, it does happen. Good question. All right, hybrid infertility. All right, you get the fertilization. The hybrid is made. That joint organism between the two, it's made. It's born. Whoa, they have some kind of hybrid species, some new organism, but, well, I shouldn't say species, a new organism is made. The offspring, even though it lives, it can't reproduce. It's infertile. So we get to that new level, is that you do have something. You do have an offspring, but they are not any kind of new species because they can't make a next generation. So example, a horse. If you made a horse and a donkey, they make a mule, but the mule is sterile. So they can make these mules. And the only way that you can ever get mules is to have a horse and a donkey made again and again and again, because the mules can't make their own offspring. There's also the, the tiger and the lion. They can get together. Um, and the offspring, it depends on if the tiger is male or female and the lion is the male or female, depending on which, like you have a male tiger and a female lion they'll make either the tigon or the liger. They're a little bit different depending on whether you have the male tiger or the female tiger and the male of um, the other species. Okay. All right, let's talk, uh, let's take a look at this question. Fruit fly species all look alike more or less. If you have a male and a female fruit fly, how can you prove they're the same species? Give these a look over. All right, let's take a look at these. All right, so one, determine the base sequence of the DNA of their chromosomes. Can you do that? Who has the ability to sequence DNA? Any of you have that going on in your life? Yeah, no, I don't. That's a pretty expensive process. So, I mean, maybe we could do that, but that would take a long process and a lot of money and technology. So I'm gonna say maybe to that one, right? If you're looking at it as an exam question, you could kind of say, put maybe. Examine them closely with a low power microscope, comparing their physical characteristics to published species key list of characteristics. Can you tell just by how they look physically? No, because, you know, like, look at us. We are the same species and we look a lot different. So, you know, like if an alien came down and they looked at all of us, they might think like we're a lot of different species because we don't look exactly alike. So, mm, no, I don't think, I mean, that's like, uh, 
If they perform the act of mating, then they are the same species. Okay, let's, you need something else there, right? If they mate successfully and their offspring also mate successfully, they are the same species. Oh, that one's good, right? Because that one says that they have offspring and then their offspring can have offspring. And so that's what we're looking for, right? They can mate successfully. And when we say mate successfully, it means that they have fertile offspring. And if their offspring have fertile offspring, then you know they're the same species. And so far, this is like really good, really good. If they can both asexually reproduce, no, this, no, mm -mm. we're not, we haven't even talked about asexual reproduction in terms of evolution, so no. Um, usually no. Once in a while, I'll throw one of those, but they're ex they're examples of what you might expect. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The format is similar. Yeah. So I I stick these in here to give you that practice of going through figuring how to go through um, these multiple choice questions. Yes. Because like board exams, you might see that. Like, that's kind of good, kind of good, kind of good. Oh, no, no, that's really good. So questions might not, or answers might not be apparently incorrect, that you have to find the best one, the one that is most correct. And um, also see it looks correct. It looks correct, but, it, but it, it doesn't say successfully, right? Yeah, so that's where, that's where your knowledge, you have to be able to apply what you know. And even if I didn't, if I didn't have this one in here, then you got to go back and be like, wait, which of these is the best one? Then this one, you know, this one is probably the best one out of them. So, but I'm very specific about like, you'll see that I'm going to put in all of the factors that you need to answer the question appropriately. Yeah, it's good, good practice for knowing what you're going to see a lot of you who take these board exams, you're going to see. Did you find a lot of them were like? Harder than this kind of a question? OK, yeah. So, so I'm giving you the baseline of prepping then. And I really, one of the things I want you to walk out of this semester is know how to take a multiple choice exam appropriately. Because I hate exams. I am not a good, I'm not good at taking the time also. I have ADHD, so sometimes I'm like, oh, first one, good. I have to remind myself, go through them all. So um, this kind of stuff, especially for those of you who um, ha are neurodivergent, I'm trying to teach you like, you gotta slow down you got to look at all the answers and you've got to think. You got to stop and think. Um, for seeds, um, can't they, like in general, they, they can mate with anyone then? Like, they can mate with any. So I mean, what? so it's basically saying that one, like, let's just say, oh my God, successfully, then that's like what, the, what C is saying. So that's why that, that could be an answer. Right. Right. I just, they can perform the act of mating, but like we can perform the act of mating with a lot of species that are our own. I mean, you could hypothetically go home and have sex with the dog. Don't, please. Um, right. But you're not the same species. So that's what this one is like indicating. Like you can go and have sex with anything that you can fit the parts with and all those pre-mating mechanisms. If you mate at the same time and you understand each other's behaviors and you're in the same place and um, your parts fit. That doesn't mean you're the same species. This is the pinnacle of it. You got to have fertile offspring and your offspring have to have offspring. So that's what you really need to know through all of these mating mechanisms is that it is so important to get to that pinnacle of your offspring have to be able to have offspring. Yeah. But good questions. Good to analyze these. Anybody else questions about the question? Yeah, so uh, there will not be an, there not, will not be four obvious, no, that is so not right. There will be some things where you're like, move on, read them all. 
Like I said, my worst thing about taking tests is I, I look at the first one and I'm like, yeah, that sounds good. And I just go on because I'm just like, oh, wait, I got to move on. I got to move on. Right. So don't do that. Make sure you read them all. And if you need to make notes, like the great thing about my exams is you can write on them. So you can like make a note, like maybe you could put maybe for some of these. You could say, you know, like if you read this, it'd be like, oh, wait, wait, success. You might write successful in there. And then you get to the next one. And you're like, oh, look at me. I said successful. And the next one said successful. Yeah, that's better. All right. So how do we get new species? This is really all about natural selection is the way we get new species. What we call getting a new species is called speciation. All right, so let's look at some scenarios in which a new species can arise because we can see through the pre and post mating mechanisms that's not the way we're going to get new species. So we have two things that can happen. Isolation and genetic divergence. I wouldn't make a note here because I always forget to add this into the notes, but maybe this year I'll actually put it in there. This all revolves around natural selection. All right, the first one is isolation. Something happens and your population gets separated. When they get separated, likely what's going to happen is that they start to experience different environments. And we're going to get we're going to get some more details about that in a second. So remember the term divergence. So these are the two things that can happen. I'm going to talk about these in detail. When we're talking divergence, So if you have your main population, whether we're talking about isolation or genetic divergence, what's happening is that on both of these, the main population gets separated. So let's say this amount gets separated here. And this population goes in this direction. And over here, they have different environmental conditions. And they also have different environmental conditions. So what they were used to here, this group is experiencing something different in, in, in the environment. And they are also. So who is favored here is going to change from here. And who is favored here is going to change from who is favored there. So here's where variants are having a lot of different kinds of traits in your population is going to be really, really important for the survival of these two groups. 
because environmental conditions are going to be a little bit different than here. And so now if you were, if you were, maybe you were struggling here, maybe over here and these new environmental conditions, you're like, oh, this is so much easier to survive. So you could have been unfavored and now you're favored. And over here where you were where you were favored, you could be unfavored. So we have some changes that are going to occur. We're going to go through that a little bit more. So the first one I want to talk about is called allopatric speciation. So here's where this isolation factor, you have a geographical barrier. Something, bam, gets in the way to separate your population. All right, this is the most common thing that happens in terms of genetic divergence and isolation. You've got a population and they're like, woo, this is great, and everybody's living, and you've got some that are struggling and some that have the favored traits in that environment, and there's an earthquake and two plates come together and they make this mountain. And so suddenly now you have a mountain. And so some of them are on this side of the mountain and some are on this side. Now, what happens is, is with this mountain is that the sun is more on this side of the mountain throughout the day. So everybody over here, they're having a really warm environment, very sunny. Everybody over here, they're having a colder environment and not sunny. So we've got a few things that might be favored over here as opposed to over here. Over here, those that are going to be favored are going to be those that, let's say that they have fur, that they have a lighter coat, so they're not just sweating all the time and losing tons of water and that they also can be more resistant to the UV rays. So you've got a couple things happening over here that's favored. On this side, you have to have individuals who are maybe have a lot more fat on them because it's colder and have thicker fur. So we've got who's favored on either side of this divergence. It's very different. What can happen over time is this mountain just stays and stays and stays then those who have thin fur and can resist UV rays, that those traits will be favored in the population over here. And over here, the like fatter, thicker furred ones are gonna be favored. Let's say over a million years, this mountain starts to fall. And a million years later, it gets low enough that they can make their ways over and meet each other again. The processes of natural selection have been happening to each of them differently. So when they come back together, if you want to determine, are they still the same species? It goes back to that last question. If when they come back together, if individuals can mate from this side and this side, if they can mate, they could have fertile offspring who can also have offspring, then they're still the same species. But when that mountain falls, if they come back together and they try and mate, but they don't have fertile offspring, they are no longer the same species. They have genetically diverged enough to become a different species. So this is the most common thing that could happen. It could be a flood where there's like a big river that comes in between. Um, it could be like a canyon. You get this deep gully, they can't get to each other. So it could be a variety of just very huge environmental issues that happen to separate them. <clears throat> When you have this huge geographical barrier, you have this thing that separates them, gene flow stops. Remember that gene flow is when members of a population can mate with each other. The genes flow between members. So again, this geographical thing, this big barrier, it prevents the genes from flowing from this side and this side. They can't get to each other. So no gene flow. They are experiencing the process of natural selection independently. The traits that are favored are different on each side of the geographical barrier. 
And this may be very different from what that original population, the characteristics that were favored. So evolution is happening to each of the populations, but in different ways because of natural selection. And back to my last point of this whole description of these issues is that if they can't reproduce together later, come back together, then they are no longer the same species. A new species has been created. This does not happen instantaneously. instantaneously. This happens over a long period of time. Because who's going to be favored? The changes in that population are going to take a long time to happen. The gene pool is going to change, and that's going to take a long time to happen. The percentage of what traits are favored are going to change, but it's not going to happen in one or two generations. It's going to happen over a long, long period of time. Okay, so here's an example of that. You've got these lizards are on an island, and this log comes by and three of them are like, oh, let's hang out on this log. Uh-oh, the log starts moving and they get carried over to the island over here. If this island is sunnier and this is more green, those that are more green are gonna be able to hide in the grasses and the trees and survive better. And over here, those that have like a darker melanin or pigment in their skin can resist UV rays better so darker skin over time is favored here. And then let's say over time, if they come back or another log comes along and some of them come back over here, if they can mate, they're the, still the same species. If they cannot mate, they are different species and genetic divergence has happened through isolation. Talk about a different kind of isolation, which is called sympatric speciation. This is not as common. This is very similar to ecological isolation. All of these live in the same place. So the species, they do not have a geographical barrier. They live in the same area. But they specialize in what they do in those areas in different ways. So just like my example of like, you go to the same gym all the time and you never see that person because they work out at night and you work out early in the morning because of your school schedules, your family schedules, your job schedules. You may have never seen them, you may never see them. So this is what sympatric speciation is about, is that they live in the same place, but they specialize in different things. We'll get to this idea of niche. The term niche means like every aspect of your life. What you eat, who your predators are, who you prey on, what diseases you're susceptible to, what your house looks like, what you do during the day, how do you contribute to an ecosystem? Everything about your life, every detail of your behaviors, where you live, where, how you act, what you need, that's your niche. It's everything about your life. If a niche between members of the same species are so similar that you're constantly competing, you're going to be harmed, right? Competition, one of the things that we know about competition is that members who have the same, everything in their life going on, they're gonna be competing constantly to get all their needs fulfilled and survive. Evolution does not favor competition. So when you have a lot of competition, your chances of surviving and reproducing are low. If you specialize in certain areas of your niche to make your competition less, make your survival better, then you'll be able to survive easier, have offspring, and reproduce, and keep yourself going or your species going. The idea of sympatric speciation is that you're like, oh gosh, life is too stressful, so I'm just gonna like specialize over here. Maybe everybody lives here and you're like, I'm going to live on the outskirts. I'm going to, I know it's harder to build my home over here, 
But if I do that over time, that will make me not compete with everybody over here all the time. So you're going to lessen your competition. That's sympatric speciation. What can happen is over time, you just like start specializing in so many different things that genetically you become different than the main population. So here, if we have some flies and all the flies are feeding off this particular apple tree and everybody can't get fed by that particular apple tree, some of the flies may go, well, there's this other kind of apple tree over here that nobody's eating. So if I go over there, I'm gonna lessen my competition for all this food here. And now I could get maybe a little bit of that, but I can get all of this too. And over time, even though the trees are right in the same area, the flies that eat this may genetically become different than the flies that eat that. But again, happening in the same area. And then there's mutation. Mutation, of course, we know leads to genetic isolation and variation, that we can have these little mistakes that pop up and they can make us different to a point where you can't even make. Genetic isolation is very significant when we're talking about mutations in the sperm and the egg. If you have a muta mutation to your gametes, your sperm and egg, you might not be able to mate anymore. This often occurs in plants. If you take a botany class, plants you will learn are so weird. They do really, really weird stuff. Plants do things that other species cannot do. All right, so let's say we've got a plant here and its species number is 10. And sperm and the oocyte, they'll have a chromosome number of five and five to come back together to make 10. But what plants sometimes do is they'll produce the normal kinds of sperm and egg, but then they'll do what's called polyploidy, where they may have double triple or quadruple the number, number of chromosomes in their sperm and eggs. So they might have they might produce all these different kinds of sperm where one sperm has double the amount of chromosomes, triple, quadruple. And when a polyploid gets together with the oocyte, then they're going to make different numbers of chromosomes in the offspring. So you can get 10, 15, 20, or 25 chromosomes in your offspring. Now that seems like no, right? Didn't I, you're gonna be like, didn't you say before that too much DNA was really, really, really bad? Yes, but for some reason, plants can deal with this. However, This one So when you have a 5 and a 5 and they get together to make the normal 10, they have fertile offspring. These ones the polyploids do not have fertile offspring. So let's think about what this means. If their offspring are not fertile, they do not have the ability to produce sperm and egg, right? So one of the things when we're talking about plants, the fertile offspring is that they don't have offspring. How do we see offspring in plants? If you're thinking about like strawberries, What's going to be missing from a strawberry that is made through polyploidy? What will the strawberry not have on it? On the outside, the things that get cut in your teeth. The seeds, you know the little things on the outside of the strawberry that often get stuck in your teeth? There'll be no seeds. 
So what we end up getting is you get seedless fruits and veggies. Now, my son, who's like, he doesn't know so much about like seeded stuff, because a lot of times like watermelon, he's like, well, make sure you get the ones that don't have the black things in there. Because we have a lot more of that available to us, is this process of having the ability to make offspring through the seeds, or the seedless, that you do not have the ability to make the seeds because you're a polyploid. And think about this, when you eat a watermelon like that and you spit out the seeds, you're spitting out all these embryos because in each one of these seeds is an embryo. Or an apple, when you throw out the apple core, you just threw out like five embryos. So for our own convenience, people do this on purpose as they try and get the polyploids so that they can make both seeded watermelon and seedless because people like this seedless stuff. All right, I know I skipped over this before, so. Let's look at the difference between allopatric speciation and sympatric speciation. Just remember, the big thing is that allopatric speciation to create genetic divergence is there is some kind of a geographical barrier. So you might wanna write like geographical barrier, something big gets in between them for allopatric speciation. So this stream starts to separate them. Something big gets in between and separates the population and allopatric. In sympatric, this is, and you might want to write niche specialization. They live in the same place, but they do different things to lower the amount of competition, thus giving them an easier time of surviving and reproducing. So this niche specialization is very different. This is a great way to ease your competition, help you survive easier through allopatric, sorry, through sympatric speciation, sympatric speciation, niche specialization, ease that competition, give you an easier time surviving and the possibility of also reproducing. Since the Pleistocene age, ice age, a long, long time ago, Deserts have been gradually forming in the Southwest United States. As the original lakes and rivers in this area shrank from connected streams into isolated streams, the fishes living in them developed a strong potential for what? So this is overall the general thing that we have just been talking about. Were we talking about speciation, hybridization, polyploidy, tempor temporal isolation, or I didn't even mention this word. So sometimes I'll put in words that sound very like vocabulary-like. If I haven't talked about this in the whole unit, you're gonna be like, okay, cool. She didn't even talk about that, right? So that's, those are like gimmies for you. So overall, what's happening here? Just the overall big picture. Yeah, speciation. So right, they're getting separated. That's speciation, the potential for speciation, I should say. Okay, and then that example, was that an example of allopatric or sympatric? Yeah, good. Okay, so that's allopatric because of geographical barrier occurs. So there could be on your exam two questions like that, where I ask a question and then I ask a follow-up question. Extinction is a natural part of evolution. It's normal. However, so let me just say extinction, the definition of extinction is the death of all the members of a species. You will also find that tacked onto that, there will be different definition parts like for 50 years. You don't see the species. What we have found that as humans, because no one has seen a species for at least 50 years, 
they'll say this is extinct. And then 20 years later, after it's labeled as extinct, somebody finds it again in some weird niche of the world. That there you have that niche specialization or that sympatric issue where they're like, I'm going to go off and go over here because things are getting bad here. And they might find them again. So as humans, we sometimes will label things as extinct and then they find them again. Check this out. 99% of all species that have ever existed have gone extinct. There's a 1% chance that humans live, that anything lives. So that's huge. Generally, it's due to environmental change or climate change. So I always laugh when people say, I don't believe in climate change. I'm like, well, it's been happening since the earth was created. The earth used to be covered in water. Now it's not. That's climate change. And then they go, oh, right. Humans have induced climate change to accelerate at rates we've never seen before. And because we have done that, we have acted as agents of natural selection on every species on the earth, thus causing extinctions to happen. So we have accelerated extinctions we have caused what we believe to be the sixth mass extinction of the earth. There have been five other mass extinctions, one of which was the dinosaurs, right? We all know that one. That dinosaurs were here and then poof, over like 70 million years, they're gone. That was one of the big mass extinctions. But they, because of our use of technology, they really believe that humans are causing a sixth mass extinction. We are making another one happen, just us alone. We're making it happen. So interesting. Okay, so what makes you vulnerable to extinction? Here's this, you know, the cute little poet, panda bear here. The panda bear prim predominantly feeds on bamboo. So talk about a picky eater. Here's an animal who pretty much only eats one thing. What if that one thing they eat gets a fungus or dies? What do you do? You gotta adapt or you're going to die off. What if you're so isolated in terms of what you eat that then you don't survive because your food source is gone? So here's where like specialization and it makes you very, very, very vulnerable. Variation is so important. If your niche, the things you rely on, the everyday portions of your life are so particular and you can't really exist outside of them. You can't change your behaviors to survive on a bunch of different food. You're going to make some trouble for yourself. The other thing is that you maybe you don't like you don't like the cold, so you only live in this one area. You don't like sunlight so much. If you do not have a large distribution, if something happens in that particular area, like there's an earthquake or a flood or there's a drought, poof, you could be gone. Okay, I'm gonna skip these for now. That's where. And then what about your interactions with other species? Competition, as I keep mentioning today, competition does not favor evolution. Evolution, sorry, evolution does not favor competition. If you have a lot of things that are eating you, a lot of predators, that could be bad news. If you're susceptible to a lot of different parasites, all the different parts of your niche. If you're susceptible to many things happening in your niche, you're gonna not survive very easily. And then as I mentioned, humans. Humans, we like to build stuff. So we destroy a lot of habitats. And the destruction of a lot of habitats means that we get rid of the homes of organisms, which forces them to adapt quickly. And if you can't adapt quickly, not good. All right, just last little thing. There are some benefits of preserving biodiversity. Like why should we care as humans? Right, a little bit. Okay, so just last things I want to mention is by getting rid of a lot of organisms, one, we're just like creating our niche, we're making our niches smaller, right? The things that we might rely on. In general, is it ethical to kill other things? In general, no, right? It's not ethical. So um, as looking at the way that we interact with other species on the earth, 
is it ethical to just like go and destroy a bunch of stuff? I think, you know, like kind of, we all know that's probably not a good thing. But if we're just thinking about it like more self-centeredly, we have a lot of reasons that we should preserve organisms out there. We're going to talk about when we get to ecology, ecosystem services, that organisms, just thinking like we should preserve all the organisms on the earth because we might be able to use them for our own benefit. That's what we mean by ecological self-interest. And we don't know in the future what we might need. We'll talk about keystone species too, that if we go into an ecosystem and for example, like elephants, that elephants are often highly hunted out in the savanna of Africa, if you remove the elephants, the elephants do a really good job of gardening and allowing a lot of plants to grow, a very big variety of plants. They get rid of a lot of trees so that you get this big variety. You get some trees, but you get a lot of other plants that can grow. And all of this diversity of plant life that the elephants are gardening the savanna for, those plants service all the other species in the ecosystem. So if you get rid of the elephants, the gardeners, then you're going to get this overgrowth of trees and the overgrowth of trees is not going to allow for a diversity of species and then the species all are going to start to die off. That's what we call a keystone species, a species that is really, really important to the rest of the ecosystem. So if we get rid of like one species, it could make a whole ecosystem collapse. And just also out of ecological self-interest in terms of our health, a lot of medicines are discovered in places around the world, natural places. So things that we might need to combat some virus or bacteria or fungus, um, we could kill it off. All right, so a little bit earlier than normal, but still late. All right, we're gonna go into lab. What I would do first is I would have you guys, you all water and spray your plants. If you haven't removed the plastic today, remove the plastic. Um, you can hand in your Lab 23s on the front desk. If you have questions that you all want to like talk through, do that at the beginning. But I want that handed in 